Here we see a large portion of the digestive system, which we'll talk over the next few vid videos. But in this picture, we see the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum of the small intestine, and then the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and the anus of the large intestine and small intestine. There's also some accessory organs we see here, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So we're going to cover all this in detail. One aspect of the digestive system we do not see in this image is the pharynx and the oral cavity. And that's really going to be the focus of this particular lecture. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is talk about the goal of the digestive system. And I'll suggest it's one simple goal, and that is absorption. When I say absorption, I'm talking about the movement of things from the digestive tract into our bloodstream. So when I say digestive tract, we could think of the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine. Really, nothing is absorbed from the, small in from the stomach. So really, the absorption happens mainly from the small intestine and to a lesser degree from the large intestine. But the entities or things that we're talking about are nutrients, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, water. The goal is to get all of that into our blood, into our circulation, and that's what absorption is. Keep in mind, we just finished up with the renal system. We use the word renal. We use the word reabsorption with the renal system because when entities move from the lumen of the nephron into the blood, they are moving into the blood for a subsequent or second time upon their journey in the body. That is to say, absorption occurs between the interface of the GI tract and our blood. Once these nutrients, vitamins, minerals, water, what have you, get into our bloodstream, then they can be distributed throughout our whole body to be made use of. For example, glucose, which is a carbohydrate, it's a monosaccharide, it's a simple carbohydrate, that can be distributed throughout the whole body so different cells of different tissues can produce ATP. Or amino acids, for example, which are the building blocks of proteins, can be distributed throughout the whole body so different tissues and cells can reconstitute those amino acids to make proteins such as collagen or hemoglobin or insulin. So the goal is absorption. And there's a number of things that allow absorption to happen. First, we're going to consume food products, and that's going to be via our oral cavity. And then there's within our oral cavity is where mechanical and chemical digestion commences. Mechanical digestion is merely the breaking down of those fruit, food products into smaller pieces, increasing the surface area so chemical, chemical digestion can begin to do its work. The greater the surface area, the more effective chemical digestion is. Then once things have been broken down, they can be absorbed. We'll talk about that. And things that cannot be absorbed, such as fiber, are going to be formed into fecal matter, and then it's going to be eliminated or defecated from the body. So we're going to talk about all of that. And let's just talk about the different regions of the digestive tract. To be clear, sometimes this will be referred to as the GI tract or gastrointestinal tract. And that's somewhat of an incomplete term because gastrointestinal really refers just to the stomach and the small and large intestines. But this whole process is certainly commencing or beginning in the oral cavity or the mouth, moving on to the pharynx, esophagus, stomach, the different regions of the small intestine, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum, and the different regions of the large intestine, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and the anus. So we're going to look at all these in the videos that follow. Let's take a look at the oral cavity, and the oral cavity is pretty familiar to all of us. We the majority of the oral cavity is covered with stratified squamous epithelial tissue, some of which is keratinized, some somewhat like the epidermis of the skin. 
the gingiva and the hard palate of the oral cavity has the keratin layer or it is keratinized. The rest of the oral cavity is stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Right here, we can see the upper lip attached to the gingiva or the gums by the labial frenulum. And there is also a labial frenulum that attaches the lower lip to the lower gum region. Keep in mind the gums are covering bone on the gingiva on the upper region or the upper gum, if you will, is covering the maxilla and the gum or gingiva of the lower region down here is going to be covering the mandible. Generally speaking, everyone has 32 teeth unless there's been some extractions. Maybe people didn't develop all 32 teeth and that's certainly fine. But the general makeup of teeth are, and I'm just doing this based on a quadrant of the mouth, is two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. And that makes up a total of eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight times two is 16. So theoretically, 16 teeth in the upper jaw or within the maxilla and then 16 teeth on the lower jaw or within the mandible. These right here, these somewhat green structures are the lingual tonsils. This right here is the uvula. And of course, this is the tongue which is peppered by a bunch of bumps known as papillae, and we'll talk about those. The tongue functions. There are receptors for a number of different stimuli that the mouth is going to come in contact with. Taste certainly is one of them, texture is another, and temperature is an yet another. So keep in mind, if we eat something hot, we can tell it's hot because there are temperature receptors within the tongue, within the papillae of the tongue. So the papillae are, once again, all these bumps distributed throughout the tongue, most of which are specific to texture. The tongue is made up of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. It is not keratinized. And the papillae are, once again, are housing the taste buds. And we're going to look at an image of a close-up look at the taste buds. But first, let's take a look at just a general makeup of a tooth. Right here and here and in the middle, this is bone. Let's pretend this is the maxilla. And we see the tooth embedded within the bone, specifically within the alveolar socket or within the alveolus. So if we were to take the tooth out of this bone, there would be two gaps, empty gaps right here. And those are the alveoli or the alveolar sockets. The roots of the tooth are embedded within the sockets. Any component of the tooth that's above the gum line or above the bone is going to be the crown of the tooth. So we have a crown and we have the roots. This right here is gingiva or gum. Once again, this is bone. The great majority of the interior of a tooth is made up of dentine, which is this yellowish structure right here. This is the pulp cavity. And this is the root canal going down both of the roots right here. Keep in mind the tooth is a type of joint known as a gomphosis. A gomphosis is a type of synarthrotic joint that allows bone to be bound to bone via some type of fibrous tissue. To be clear, teeth are not bone, but the term gomphosis and synarthrosis still applies to the teeth. And the fibrous tissue is this, this periodontal ligament that we see in green right here. We see lymphatic vessels, nerve fibers, and blood supply going to and leaving the root canal and pulp cavity. The roots of the teeth are lined by cementum. That's the type of material that covers the roots. Once again, this is dentine, the majority of the interior of the tooth, and covering the outside of the crown is enamel, which is the hardest substance in the body. And it's actually what we find in a lot of fossilized remains of hominids, early humans, or of other extinct mammalian species, because the enamel is so extremely hard. It's super hard, but it cannot be replaced. So if we ever wear down our enamel, which is certainly possible, that has to be artificially 
replaced or fixed. Let's talk about gustation. And once again, gustation is the taste sensation. There's roughly 4,000 taste buds throughout the tongue distributed in different regions of the tongue. The main type of taste bud that I want to talk about are the valate papillae, which contain about 250 different types of taste buds. Now, there is a filiform papillae, but it's really detecting texture rather than taste. And there's some other taste buds that we can talk about. What we're really focusing on the valate papillae. The different types of tastes that we can sense, one is sweetness, another is salty, one is sour, another is bitter, and there's one known as umami, which is the ability essentially to taste meat or amino acids. Innervation of the tongue, specifically of the taste buds, is achieved via the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven, the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve number nine, and the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve number 10. Okay, so let's take a closer look at these taste buds. What we see right here is the stratified squamous of the tongue. So this would be of one of the bumps or the papilla of the tongue. Right here are some neurons or nerve fibers that are detecting the sensation of taste that's going to send that information to different areas of the brain. And the sensory receptors for taste or gustation are found on these microvilli or hair fibers as they're referred to. In pink here, we see the taste cells. Once again, these have the microvilli. And on the microvilli, we find the receptors for specific tastes such as sweet, salty, bitter, sour, or umami. The gap between the epithelial tissue is the taste pore. That's where these microvilli or receptors gain access, or I should say the taste molecules gain access to the receptors on their microvilli. In green here, these are just support cells of the taste bud. These are nuclei in the middle, middle of all of these cells. And these are secretory vesicles right here. So we talked about activation of neurons when we were talking about the nervous system. Neurons release neurotransmitters from synaptic vesicles. To be clear, these taste cells are not neurons. As a result, these are, synap these are not synaptic vesicles, but they are certainly secretory vesicles. So we can see there's some sort of signaling molecule bound within these secretory vesicles that when they are released, they are going to activate these neurons. Once again, a neuron is a nerve fiber that is excitable. That is to say, it can have an action potential and release neurotransmitters down on their far right end. In this case, it's on the far right. The release of neurotransmitters from these nerve fibers are going to activate certain areas of the brain to let us know, wow, we just tasted something sweet or something salty. So when a some sort of taste molecule binds to the receptor on these taste cells, it's going to excite these taste cells or cause an action potential and specifically a depolarization event, which is going to cause the release of the signaling molecules within these specific secretory vesicles. The signaling molecule, whatever it is, is going to bind to the dendrites on the neurons exciting these neurons, causing an action potential in the neurons that go all the way to regions in the brain, once again, to highlight the brain to the fact that we are tasting something. So once again, the taste bud is composed of the stratified squamous of the papilla, microvilli of the taste cells, supporting cells, secretory vesicles with the signaling molecules, and the associated neurons.